Mayor is going to come and read our reading. John chapter 2, verse 13 to 22. That's uh, page 1065 on the New Testament in our church Bibles. Jesus clears the temple courts. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at the table exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove them all away the, the temple courts, both sheep and cat, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money ch changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, "Get this out of here! Stop turning my father's house into a market." The disciples remembered that is that it is written, "Zeal for your house." will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove, us, to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled that he had said that they believed the scriptures. Then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. And that is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to Thanks God. Be to God. Charles, I'm coming up. Pray for you, brother. Father, I do thank you for the ministry of the word, and I pray, Lord, that you, by your spirit today, will be with Charles as he brings the preached word. Lord, I pray that you will speak to us, each of us, in our hearts, Lord, through what you're wanting to say to us. So, Lord, I ask that your power will come now and that you will guide his words, his lips, his thoughts. Lord, that this will be a word from you to us. So, Lord, we pray for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord this morning. Some of you are still cold. Let everything that has breath this morning praise the Lord. So you got to look like somebody who has breath. You got to praise God like somebody who has breath because he has given you and I breath this morning. Okay, thank you that you survived the cold. Some people died during this snowstorm. Do you know that? If as a matter of fact, yesterday morning, I thought I wasn't going to be able to make it to church today. I was going to call Wendy or call the Reverend and say, listen, I think you forget I'm not coming to church because I looked out of my windows. I couldn't drive my car. They were spinning in the snow and I thought, how do I get to the road? And look at how amazing God is. There's almost no sign of the snows on the road. Good job. I didn't call you too early yesterday morning. We got to have faith, Reverend. We got to have faith. <laughs> okay, he was here, so here we are. Thank you so much for that prayer. I thank the Lord this morning, and I believe he'll give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of his word this morning as I share it with the church uh, today. Uh, thank you so much. I, Lord, I ask you for clarity of speech and clarity of expression as I share your holy word with your people this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, as Neil read so beautifully this morning, uh, the uh, gospel of John chapter 2, quite an interesting passage. And I want to try and put it a little bit more into context this morning as we share the word. Now, if you remember the synoptic gospels, that is the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, talked um, about this particular incident sli uh, slightly differently. This incident was shown towards the end of Jesus Christ's ministry on earth in those other three Gospels. But in the Gospel of John, he's giving us a bit more detail. All right, John tends to give us a bit more detail about what actually happened. Now, in the Gospel of John, this incident was shown at the very beginning 
of our Lord's ministry. Okay, now if you remember verse 2, initially talked about the Lord Jesus Christ turning water into wine. If you remember that uh, particular passage, uh, which I think nearly everyone knows that particular uh, story. It talked about the Lord turning uh, water into wine. Now his disciples were watching. That was his very first miracle. And the Bible told us, of course, that he went home to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples. And the disciples believed in him when they saw that first miracle of turning water into wine. What we're about to read yet again, potentially, is the second. Okay, so, uh, so in, in terms of context, that is really the beginning of that entire chapter. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the Passover feast itself and what actually happened. Now, the Passover was an annual event which commemorated the time when God rescued the children of Israel out of Egypt with a mighty hand. You remember the ten plagues, of course, in that particular, uh, um, in the book of Exodus, chapter 12, verse 1 to 13, tells us about the plague and how the Lord rescued the children of Israel. So the Lord essentially instituted the Passover feast that every year it must be celebrated so that they will remember this amazing work that he did in taking them out of that terrible slavery. Now, uh, God ordered all Israelites, all their families, to slay a lamb and to smear the blood of the lamb on the two doorposts, on the lintel of their houses, so that the dirt angel, when he comes through, will pass over their homes and their firstborn children will be spared. God also ordered that this must be celebrated or commemorated on an annual basis. This, by the way, the Passover feast is one of the most important and the holiest feasts in the entire Jewish calendar. The word Jerusalem conjures up, if you will, an ominous picture in the mind because it is the central place of opposition to our Lord Jesus Christ and where they'll end up killing him in Golgotha, which is in Jerusalem, if you remember. Verse 14, when the Lord arrived, where? Arrived at the temple. He found the temple had been turned into a marketplace with many people selling uh, oxen or cattle, sheep and doves. The animals and birds were sold to the worshippers quite legitimately. Okay, because these were sold to the worshippers so they could carry out their sacrifices to God. The doves were for people who were too poor to afford the cattle and the sheep. So the dove was a substitute for those people. The Lord Jesus Christ also found bureau de changes. They found a lot of people selling money, changing currencies. All right? So these people were at hand to do their business, which was also legitimate. Because historians, as I was researching this particular topic, historians tell us that on average in Jerusalem, there's usually about 50,000 people in terms of population normally. But during this period of the Passover, the volume of people can actually grow to as much as nearly 200,000 inhabitants, Okay. So these people have come, as you can imagine, from far away places. Imagine the strain that will be on the local resources, accommodation, where to place these people, food, where are these people going to find enough food to eat. So it, was, it has some kind of a fair atmosphere about it. Okay, you can almost just picture it. However, so coordinating all of these would have been truly enormous. All right? The money changes took the money of those people who came from foreign countries and changed it into local currency that they could use in Jerusalem to pay for their temple taxes. So it was a legitimate exercise. Such commerce would have proven to be necessary because the people coming from long distances could not bring their own animals to travel down with them. Only first-rate unblemished animals are acceptable for sacrifice to the Lord. And it will be difficult to maintain an animal in perfect condition, even on a journey from nearby Galilee 
almost impossible for those people who will be coming, of course, from places like Rome or Egypt or other faraway places to Jerusalem. So you can begin to really picture what's going on here. Now, there would have been many people offended by the crowding and the stink in the premises of the temple with all those animals. You can almost just imagine it, all right? And they would have been obviously secretly pleased that the Lord Jesus Christ will remove this offense from the temple vicinity. Well, our Lord made a whip of cord and issued a command, this is verse 15, to take those things away, and he drove the merchants out of the temple, commanding them not to make his father's house a marketplace. Now, the noise and the smell would have been overwhelming. In fairness, we must acknowledge that the sacrificial system, as prescribed by the Torah, is a messy, bloody, smelly business, if you think about it. It was a miracle in itself that our Lord Jesus was able to clear out the temple in such a crowded situation. It is not recorded whether he used the whip on anybody or not. But I think as a form of authority, he brandished the whip and threatened them to clear up. At this stage, it is important to note that many of these people would have been taken by surprise at Jesus' action. Firstly, he had no true credentials. Remember, this was the beginning of his ministry. All right, the first example was turning water into wine. Next minute, we see him in the temple brandishing a whip, clearing out all these people who are used to doing this on a regular basis. So clearly, questions are beginning to rise up in people's minds. Who is this chap? Firstly, he had no true credentials as far as they were concerned for doing this. The priest had not acknowledged him as a priest. Neither had the scribes or Pharisees counted him as one of their own. He had not studied with eminent rabbis as you tend to do in the old days. If you remember the Apostle Paul's story, we are told he studied at the feet of Gamaliel. He had not studied with the feet of any of the rabbis. No authorities of note had conferred on him any authority. And in the presence of everybody, he's brought out his whip and instructing everyone to clear out. So you can imagine them scratching their heads and really wondering what's going on here. Okay? So I hope contextually that's putting into a bit more picture for you. Now, nonetheless, he takes it on himself to take the necessary action on one of the temple's busiest and most important days. Verse 17. When his disciples saw what was happening, they were then reminded of Psalm 69, verse 9, where it was predicted by the amazing King David that when the Messiah comes, he will be utterly consumed with zeal for all things pertaining to God. Now they saw Jesus manifesting an intense determination that the worship of God should be pure. And they realized that this was one of whom the psalmist had spoken about or prophesied. At this time, it is also important to remember that when the temple of God, then the temple of God was a physical structure made out of bricks and stone. But today, as we all know, those of us who have bowed our knees to Christ and have been reborn, we all know that God's temple is no longer in bricks and mortar or stone. God's temple is inside you and I. So just as the Lord Jesus Christ wanted to keep his father's house pure, so it is also required for us and from us to equally turn our bodies into or over to the Lord for continuous cleansing. Let me just go through that again. Just as important as it was for the Lord to clear out the temple, to make the temple pure for sacrifice and for worship, 
So it is important today, since we are now the temple of the living God, to turn our bodies over to him in living sacrifice, to invite him in to constantly cleanse us so we can be presented before him as pure. So the next four verses, our Lord Jesus Christ now begins to predict his death. Verse 18, the Jews now questioned, after he's cleared out all these people from the temple, the Jews now had to ask a burning question, which was in their hearts. On whose authority did you do all of these? Did you cast out all the businessmen from our premises, from our temple? They demanded that they should perform some sign to demonstrate that he had the authority to act the way he acted. Okay? That's why they posed that question to him. On whose authority did you just do all of these? <laughs> now, Jesus responded with a st- I mean, I have to laugh because you just can imagine Jesus Christ. Because I was thinking for a long time, what is the correlation between these two Scenarios, but I understand now. So, since they posed the question to him, whose authority, on whose right authority, did you just do what you just did? Jesus responded with a startling statement concerning his death and his resurrection. The Lord has a way of kind of getting to the end of your, it kind of gets to the end of what it is you're trying to say. It doesn't wait for you to, it just gives you the end. Uh, Uh, (laughs) uh, the end result, the end goal. He answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. (laughs) (laughs) These guys are thinking, what has this guy drank? Is he drinking something strong? Or has he... Who's who's this guy? What did you just say? Remember, a lot of these guys were learned people. They have spent lifetimes studying. These were not sort of low-life players who don't have a clue. These were like the cream of the crop. These were guys versed in law, versed in the book. But, so they're looking at this young man, telling them, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up again in three days. Huh. <sighs> Well, the Jews were confused, and I would have been confused as well. And as they were scratching their heads, wondering if this fellow was all right, they ventured to ask him, do you know it took 46 years for this edifice, for this building to be erected? And we know what it took to have that building built. They ventured to ask him, and you are saying you will raise this building up in three days? <laughs> but Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body in which the fullness of the Godhead dwelt, not in some building. So they didn't understand that. However, in verse 22, later on, after the Lord had been crucified and had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had promised to rise again in three days. With such a marvelous fulfillment of prophecy before their very eyes, they believed the scripture, trusted, relied on the word, i.e. the message that Jesus had said to them. In closing, we, we often come across truths which are difficult to understand. However, we learn here that we should treasure the word of God in our hearts. Only a couple of days ago, I am endeavoring to read the scripture beginning to the end. I've been promising myself to do that for many years. Never, never could do it, uh, Reverend. As I went through some of the most challenging times of my life last year, had prayer from the church. Nearly everything that could be shaken in my life was shaken last year in 2017. 
I found myself needed inspiration. Now, this is me who spends my life inspiring people. That's my business. I'm a trainer and I'm a speaker. Here I am, not able to help myself. Physician couldn't heal himself. I had to lean on God to get out of bed in the morning. Some mornings, I needed the Lord to get me up. That's how tough last year was for me. From the glorious 2016 to a terrible 2017. If you remember praying for me, I'm not sure if you remember, remember that. So I made certain commitments. Because a lot of times when these difficulties happen in your life, you don't run away, but you run to God. Difficulties and testing times are meant to enable God to find out what is truly in your heart. Okay, remember Job's wife told Job, cost the Lord and die. I was saying to the Reverend this month, we were praying this morning to the, uh, to the group that uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 2 to 3, was telling us that the Lord led the children of Israel through the wilderness. His goal, getting them out of Egypt, was to take them to the promised land. So to take them to a place, to an amazing place. The same thing he wants to do for you and I. Take us from where we were to where he really wants us to be. But along the way, during the journey, we are told that he tested and tried them. If you look at the Amplified, he said he stretched them beyond limits. Beyond limits. I need to emphasize that word this morning. Okay? Because I experienced that. He said he tested them. But why did he test them? He said he wanted to know what was in their heart. That is loaded. I will endeavor and ask you to go study that, honestly. To know what was in their hearts, to know whether they would love him and keep his commandments. Do you know it's easy to keep God's commandment when all things are going great for you? Let adversity or catastrophe hit you and find out if you want to even mention God's name. That gives you an idea of how close or how far you are away from God. So he allows these things to happen. So I was reading and I was asking some questions only a couple of weeks ago. And I couldn't understand. I said, Lord, I don't understand this. Father, this is way too harsh. Oh, no, 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 I can't. I'm reading some of the things he was doing in those days. Because we've moved too far away from the old to the new. And we're forgetting how the Lord used to deal with people in the old days. And I said, I began to remind myself. I'm like, Lord, this, I'm sorry, sir. I can't. That's what I told him. I said, sorry, I can't, I can't take this. This is too much. And I asked some questions with Balak and Balaam's uh, situation. I said, Lord, I'm sorry. As a leader, I'm reading from a leader's perspective. I know you want me to hear your heart, not just the actions, but this don't make sense to me. Do you know, a week later, I called a prophet friend of mine. Bet he explained it just like that. I said, but where did you get that from? It's not in the scripture. A week later, I was reading another book. Exactly the same answer the other prophet gave me. This time in a lot more detail. Now I understood what actually happened in that situation. And that is similar to what is actually happening here with the disciples. Do not forget the first miracle they have seen was the water to wine. And the Bible tells us that they believed in him. Now what's about to happen now, since they saw this body, Jesus Christ our Lord raised up from the dead on the third day. It says here that they believed the scripture. They trusted, they relied on the word Jesus had said to them. We often come across truths which are difficult to understand. However, we learn here that we should treasure the word of God in our hearts. Because these living words, someday the Lord will make it plain to us and even bring to our remembrance some of the things he had taught us through the Holy Spirit. Things we do not understand now. When the scripture says that they believed the scripture, it means that they believed the Old Testament predictions concerning the resurrection of the Messiah, and they trusted in him. This is the word of the Lord.